In the creed, we say that we believe in Christ Jesus, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. This is the subject matter for this lesson. And of course, the cross of Jesus Christ stands at the very center of his life. In the cross, we find our only hope. And this section of the catechism uses the phrase paschal mystery. And it's important for us to understand that this term paschal mystery refers to the entirety of our Lord's saving death and glorious resurrection. Paschal comes from Passover. Remember that the events of our Lord's cross and resurrection take place at Passover time. And uh, so when we use the term Paschal Mystery, we are referring to everything that took place on that Passover, our Lord's cross, His burial, and His glorious resurrection. This feast of Passover and the Paschal Mystery stand at the heart of the life of our Lord and the life of the church. God accomplishes his plan once and for all by the cross and resurrection of Christ. It was necessary that our Lord should suffer and so enter into his glory. Faith seeks understanding as to the Paschal mystery, a mystery that is handed on to us through the Gospels and a mystery that is illumined by other studies studies into what crucifixion meant in the Roman Empire and how these matters were carried out. The more we learn about the crucifixion of Jesus from a pragmatic point of view, the deeper grows our faith for who would endure such sufferings except one who loved us very, very much. The death of our Lord calls into question and puts into focus the relationship that our Lord has with his people Israel. Jesus' ministry is met with opposition from the Pharisees and from the Sadducees and the scribes, the priests. The Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him to put him to death, St. Mark teaches us. Why? Because our Lord expelled demons, forgave sins, healed on the Sabbath, gave new interpretations of the law, and showed familiarity with tax collectors and sinners. He is accused of blasphemy and false prophecy, religious crimes which the law punished with death. But Christ's relationship with the Pharisees are not entirely polemical. There are aspects of the life of the Pharisees that in fact are signs of holiness and signs of sincerity. At the essence, our Lord's crimes for which he was convicted point to the great difficulties that he was having with the core of the Jewish faith, the essential elements of Judaism, such as the law, submission to all written commandments and oral traditions. We will take a look at how Jesus stood in relationship to the law and also uh, in relationship to the temple, uh, its centrality as the holy place where God encountered his people. We'll talk about how Jesus uh, dealt with the temple and also faith in one God uh, because we will get into the whole subject of how Jesus was accused of blasphemy or making himself God's equal. First, the Lord's relationship with the law. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, I have come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And our Lord would fulfill the law, 
by keeping it down to the least of the commandments. He alone could keep the law perfectly. No one among the Jews could do this. Hence the need for the Day of Atonement that they would experience once a year. All of them, all of the Jewish people, atoning for their sins, recognizing that none of them had kept the law perfectly in the year that preceded. For the Pharisees, it was important to observe not only the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law. This movement great, led to great religious fervor at the time of Jesus, a zeal that, were it not to lapse into hypocritical casuistry, could only prepare the people for the unprecedented intervention of God through the perfect fulfillment of the law by the only righteous one in the place of all sinners. The Pharisees were calling people to conversion and a perfect living out of the law, but unfortunately what they were asking people to do was entirely impossible. Uh, they were asking people to dress, for example, as they were for temple worship, not just during the worship in the temple, but in their everyday activities. They were taking these rules to the extreme and saying that this is the way that God wants us to live. Jesus comes to show that only he can fulfill the law perfectly. And when he fulfills the law perfectly, it gives the Lord the right to teach in such a way that would ultimately be confusing for the Pharisees. It would seem that he was undoing the law when in fact he was doing nothing of the sort. Only the divine legislator, only the Lord, could fulfill the law perfectly. In Jesus, the law is no longer on stone tablets, but upon the heart of the servant who becomes a covenant to the people. Jesus fulfills the law by taking upon himself the curse of the law, namely death. Jesus fulfills the law by taking upon himself the curse of the law, namely death. Death is incurred by those who do not follow the law. His death takes place to redeem them, to redeem all people from the transgressions of the first covenant. In relationship to the law, Jesus is called a rabbi. He's called a teacher. And the rabbis in Jesus' day were the ones who helped to explain the law. They helped to other people to understand what God's expectations were for them, what God's will was all about, what God's law was all about. Our Lord was addressed as a rabbi. Uh, he taught with authority and not like the scribes. He didn't simply uh, quote other rabbis. He didn't simply quote teachers of old, but rather he would say, some say this, some say that, but I say unto you. And it was that I say unto you that was an example of his teaching with authority, not like the scribes. Jesus' authority was divine and could render human decisions void. Um, he would speak about korban, which was a way by which Jewish people could get out of obligations to take care of their elderly parents. And Jesus says, this is not God's will. This is man's will. This is a human invention. Jesus would perfect the dietary law, rendering all foods clean. Remember uh, in that passage where Jesus says, it is not what comes into a man that makes him unclean, but what goes out of him that makes him unclean. He would give a definitive interpretation of the law in regard to food, thereby putting him at odds with those who did not accept his authority.
Jesus and the law, Jesus and the temple. Remember that the temple was very dear to our Lord. He and his, his mother, his blessed mother, and St. Joseph would go up to the temple for important feast days. Uh, he went to Jerusalem. He went to the temple for the feasts of the presentation. Uh, he went as a youth on pilgrimage. This is where he became separated from the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph and was later found in the temple. And he would go up on Passover and for other feasts. Uh, it was a place of privileged encounter with God. This great temple, this, this magnificent structure, this very, very large structure that spoke by its presence. Uh, it spoke the grandeur and the majesty of God. And Jesus became angry with those who made of his Father's house a den of iniquity, a place of thieves. Jesus announced the coming destruction of the temple on the threshold of his passion. He would make a comment about the temple being torn down and then rebuilt, uh, referring, of course, to the temple of his body, but prefiguring that very sad day only a few decades later when the Roman armies would come and reduce the temple and all of the holy places in Jerusalem to rubble, never to be rebuilt again. Jesus loved the temple and so could identify himself with the temple by presenting himself as God's definitive dwelling place among men. Jesus would indeed become regarded as the new and definitive dwelling place of God. So Jesus in relationship to the law and the temple, and now Jesus in relationship to monotheism, belief in one God, which is at the very heart of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. The Lord alone is our God. The Shema Israel, that phrase from the scriptures that was kept near and dear to the heart and to the voice and to the mind of every Jewish person. If the law and the Jerusalem temple could be occasions of opposition to Jesus by Israel's religious authorities, his role in the redemption of sins, the divine work par excellence, was the true stumbling block for them. Remember that he dined with sinners. He dined with tax collectors. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He forgave sins, and yet the authorities said, who alone but God can forgive sins? This called his mission into question. By forgiving sins, Jesus is either blaspheming as a man who made himself God's equal, or is speaking the truth. Only the divine identity of Jesus' person can justify so absolute a claim as he who is not with me is against me, and his affirmation, I and the Father are one. C.S. Lewis said that as we examine the claims of Jesus to be the Son of God, we can come to only one of three conclusions. Either Jesus was a madman, like someone who would claim to be Napoleon, or he was an evil man trying to deceive, trying to lead people away from the truth, or he is exactly who he said he was. There is nothing in the life of Jesus that would indicate that he was mad. And all the good works that our Lord performed show him to be far from evil. This leads us to only one conclusion, that he truly was and is the Son of God. The tragic misunderstanding of Jesus by the Sanhedrin was to judge him as a blasphemer.
Jesus died crucified. This is what we proclaim in the creed. We believe in Jesus who was suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. What does it mean to say that he was crucified? There was a trial. There were divisions among the Jewish authorities concerning Jesus. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were part of the inner circle uh, of, of Jewish uh, brokers of power, and yet they were followers of Jesus, though secret ones for fear of the authorities. There were many more followers of Jesus among the Jewish people who expressed their belief in him after the resurrection. Religious authorities were divided about how to deal with Jesus, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the high priests all had a role to play in the death of Jesus. But we have to remember that all Jews are not collectively responsible for the death of Jesus. The personal sin of the participants, such as Judas, the Sanhedrin, and Pilate, is known to God alone. Neither all Jews indiscriminately at that time nor Jews today can be charged with the crimes committed during his passion. The Jews should not be spoken of as rejected or accursed as if this followed from Holy Scripture. In fact, who crucified our Lord? All sinners share responsibility for the crucifixion of Jesus because Jesus says from the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. Of whom did Jesus speak? Of whom did Jesus ask forgiveness? Certainly the Romans who drove the nails, certainly the Jews who cried out for his death, certainly his apostles who abandoned him, and certainly for each and every one of us. St. Francis of Assisi would put it poignantly, nor did demons crucify him. It is you who have crucified him and crucify him still when you delight in your vices and sins. The death of our Lord is for our redemption. It is part of God's plan for our salvation. Jesus was handed over according to the definitive plan of God. It was not by chance or misfortune, but part of the mystery of God's plan. This is not a Greek tragedy. Jesus did not make a misstep. This is part of God's plan for us from all eternity. This does not mean that those who handed him over were merely passive players in a scenario written in advance by God. Predestination means that each person acts according to free will in response to God's grace. He died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. The death of Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah, the prophecy of the suffering servant. Jesus himself gives this interpretation. In the scriptures we learn that Jesus would come to see himself and express himself more and more as the one who has to go to Jerusalem. He has to be turned over to evil men and accept death and then be raised from the dead on the third day. St. Paul says that for our sake, God made him to be sin. Man's sins following on original sin are punishable by death. By sending his own son in the form of a slave, in the form of a fallen humanity on account of sin, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. But no personal guilt is associated with the death of Jesus. But he assumes our guilt so much that he could say from the cross, 
My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? We must remember that this prayer from Jesus on the cross is not a sign of despair. Rather, our Lord is praying one of the Psalms, Psalm 22. It's a psalm that begins with those famous words, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? But as we pray that psalm to its completion, we realize that it is a psalm of hope, a psalm that proclaims absolute faith that God will make good things happen for those who believe in Him even though they may for a while have to suffer greatly. This psalm, Psalm 22, was a psalm that was on the lips of Jesus as He hung from the cross. It is a psalm that should be near and dear to each and every one of us as we face our struggles, as we face our trials, as we pick up our cross and follow in His footsteps. God did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, so that we might be reconciled to God by the death of His Son. You see, God takes the absolute initiative in redeeming us. God's plan for us is one of benevolent love prior to any merit on our part. And God's plan is for all people. There is not, and never has been, and never will be, a single human being for whom Christ did not suffer. Christ offered Himself to the Father for our sins. Christ's whole life, in fact, is an offering to His Father. Christ's mission here on earth is to do the will of His heavenly Father. His sacrifice expresses His loving communion with the Father. The Father loves me, and because of this I lay down my life, says the Lord. For I do as the Father has commanded me, that the world may know that I love the Father. In fact, we find in the Gospels one of the last words of Jesus, the phrase, I thirst. And this is certainly something physical. Jesus would have been very thirsty as after He carried His cross and was hanging on the cross. But it's also a metaphor, isn't it? He thirsts for our faith. As we gaze upon the crucifix, He is thirsting that we believe in Him and name Him as our Lord and Savior and follow in His footsteps. He thirsts to do the Father's will right to the end of His life, and He thirsts that we might have faith in His name. Our Lord is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, just as the Paschal Lamb on that first Passover when the people of Israel were preparing to leave Egypt. It was the blood of of the Passover lamb, the blood of the Paschal lamb on their doorposts that saved the firstborn in their household from the angel of death, so too does the blood of the Lamb of God, our Lord Jesus, on the cross save us from our sins. He is the image of the Paschal lamb by whose blood we are saved. Jesus freely embraces the Father's redeeming love. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And he does this deliberately. He lays his life down freely. No one takes my life from me, Jesus says. I lay it down on my own accord. Jesus gives his life on the cross to teach us what love is, that love is about fidelity, love is about commitment, and love is about sacrifice. Greater love hath no one than to lay down his life for his friends. This is what our Lord does for each and every one of us. It was at the Last Supper 
that our Lord anticipated His gift of His life on the cross. Jesus gave the supreme expression of His free offering of Himself at the meal shared with the twelve apostles on the night He was betrayed. The Last Supper is the memorial of His voluntary offering to the Father for the salvation of men. We think of the Eucharist as a memorial of the sacrifice. And this is something that we as Catholics hold to be very, very dear, that when we gather, we gather not as non-Catholic Christians do for the celebration of communion, the celebration of fellowship, doing what Jesus did in blessing bread and giving it to his disciples and blessing the wine and giving it to his disciples. We see in the Holy Eucharist not simply a remembrance of the Last Supper, but rather a remembrance of the Last Supper in as much as it prefigures his sacrifice on the cross because the body and blood of Jesus that hangs on the cross is the very body and blood that we receive in the Holy Eucharist. And we will discuss this in much greater depth when we study the sacraments. And that comes up in part two of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. After the Last Supper, our Lord goes out into the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, and He experiences great agony. He prays from the depth of His heart, and He prays in a way that would cause Him to sweat drops of blood. Father, let this cup pass from me. And yet He qualifies this prayer with, but not as I will, but Your will be done. He shows the offering that He will make for the forgiveness of sins. He offers a redemptive death. Indeed, Christ's death is the unique and the definitive sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. Both the Paschal sacrifice accomplishing the definitive redemption of men and the sacrifice of the new covenant restoring man to communion with God. The sacrifice of Christ is unique. It completes and surpasses all other sacrifices. First, it is a gift from God the Father Himself, for the Father handed His Son over to sinners in order to reconcile us with Himself. At the same time, it is the offering of the Son of God made man, who in freedom and love offered His life to His Father through the Holy Spirit in reparation for our disobedience. There were sacrifices offered in the temple in Jerusalem for the remission of sins. There were many sacrifices, sacrifices that needed to be repeated time and time again. But Christ's sacrifice on the cross is the definitive sacrifice the sacrifice made once and for all for the forgiveness of our sins. Perhaps for this reason, there is no need for a temple in Jerusalem anymore. There is no need for the offering of lambs and bullocks. We have the new temple, the new priest, the new lamb of sacrifice. Jesus substitutes His obedience for our disobedience. Jesus is the new Adam. Jesus atones for our faults and makes satisfaction for our sins to the Father. Jesus consummates His sacrifice on the cross. His whole life is a sacrifice, emptying Himself of His divinity, uh, lowering Himself to share in our human condition. And this great sacrifice of his entire life is consummated on the cross. The cross reveals the love of Jesus all the way to the end. No man 
not even the holiest, was ever able to take on himself the sins of all men and offer himself as a sacrifice for all. In fact, the Council of Trent, responding to the Reformers who claimed that the Catholic Church taught that we have to earn our salvation and it is by our works that we are saved, the Council of Trent makes a definitive emphasis upon the centrality of the sacrifice of Jesus. The Council of Trent emphasizes the unique character of Christ's sacrifice as the source of eternal salvation and teaches that his most holy passion on the wood of the cross merited justification for us. The claims of the Reformers are erroneous claims. The Church has always taught and will always teach that it is by the wood of the cross and the blood of our Lord that we are redeemed. Still, we must work out our salvation in fear and trembling, as St. Paul would teach. We have a role to play in making our way to heaven, but that role can only reach its goal because of the cross of Jesus. We participate in Christ's sacrifice. Jesus was united to every human person through the incarnation, and so he offers to every person the possibility of being made partners in a way known to God in the Paschal mystery, in his cross and resurrection. Jesus desires to associate with his redeeming sacrifice those who were to be its first beneficiaries. This is achieved supremely in the case of his mother, who was associated more intimately than any other person in the mystery of his redemptive suffering. She who was closest to him at his coming into the world would be at the foot of the cross as he would leave the world and her sorrows would be greater than the sorrows of any mother as she would give him back to the Father who first gave him to her. Our Lady participates in the sufferings of Christ and so can each and every one of us, especially in our sufferings. It's fitting that in Catholic hospitals, the crucifix is not placed at the head of the bed as it is in most bedrooms, but at the foot of the hospital bed, so that the one who is in the bed might gaze upon the image of the suffering Lord and thereby associate his or her sufferings with his. Jesus dies and is buried. He tasted death, the separation of the soul from the body. The state of the dead Christ is the mystery of the tomb and the descent into hell. It is also the mystery of Holy Saturday, God's great Sabbath rest after the fulfillment of man's salvation. Our Lord's stay in the tomb constitutes the real link between his passable state before Easter and his glorious and risen state today. The same person of the living one can say, I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. It was fitting that our Lord would not suffer corruption. Remember that when Lazarus dies and is buried, uh, Martha and Mary complain when Jesus says, remove the stone and let him go free. They complain, Lord, it, there will be a stench. Uh, it has been four days. And in the Jewish world, the four-day mark after death marked the point of no return, the point where uh, corruption uh, 
uh, was said to begin, the corruption of the body. But our Lord was not to experience corruption. Divine power preserved Christ's body from corruption uh, until he would rise from the dead on the third day before corruption could set in. Buried with Christ is a phrase that we use in the sacrament of baptism. Baptism represents efficaciously the descent into the tomb of Christ. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. What happened to our Lord when he went into death? What happened to the, our Lord when he descended into hell? This is the next focus of the catechism because these two mysteries are spoken of in the same creedal sentence. Because in the Paschal mystery, Jesus makes life spring forth out of the depths of death. Christ descended into hell. Jesus joined the others in the realm of the dead, but he descended there as Savior, proclaiming the good news to the spirits imprisoned there. Uh, the abode of the dead, Sheol in Hebrew, Hades in Greek, those who dwell there are deprived of the vision of God. Uh, and at the time of Jesus, uh, and in one of his parables, we, we find this descriptor, uh, the parable of Lazarus and Dives, Lazarus the poor man who begged outside of the gate of Dives the rich man. And uh, both men die, and Lazarus is carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham, Dives is thrown into the torments of hell. Notice that Lazarus is not taken to heaven. He is taken to the bosom of Abraham. He's taken to a place where he can rest, but he is deprived of the vision of God during his death. Jesus did not descend into hell to deliver the damned, nor to destroy the hell of damnation, but to free the just who had gone before him. We must not envision Jesus going down into hell as Jesus being subjected to the eternal flames of hell, but rather Jesus goes down into the dead to preach the gospel. The gospel was preached even to the dead. His mission was to accomplish redemption for all men and women of all times and places. For all who are saved have been made sharers in the redemption. And in the liturgy of the church on Holy Saturday, in the office of readings, there is a beautiful, beautiful passage that speaks to the mystery of Holy Saturday, the mystery of our Lord going down into the realm of the dead, our Lord descending into hell. The reading from the Office of Readings, an ancient homily. Today a great silence reigns on earth, a great silence and a great stillness, a great silence because the king is asleep, the earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. He has gone to search for Adam, our first father, as for a lost sheep. Greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death, he has gone to free from sorrow Adam in his bonds and Eve captive with him. He who is both their God and the son of Eve. I am your God, who for your sake have become your son. I order you, O sleeper, to awake. 
I did not create you to be a prisoner in hell. Rise from the dead, for I am the life of the dead. Jesus suffers under Pontius Pilate, is crucified, died, and is buried.